Welcome to this edition of the Ethics Rounds, April 29th. And, and the CMA code is 18824. Uh, and uh, there are directions on how to mark your attendance on the announcement that I sent out. If you have any questions, just send me an email. So um, I like to say that these ethics rounds are brought to you by the Ethical Advisory Committee of University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, <clears throat> want to remind everyone, we offer consultations 24 seven and to contact the consultation team, you could either Tiger Connect UMMC Ethics or myself or um, call my cell phone number as listed on this slide. CME credit, University of Maryland School of Medicine accredits this program and credit designation is one AMA PRA category one credit. And uh, again, you could register um, with this um, CME Cloud app. And again, the code is 18699. The objectives of these sessions is that uh, by the completion of this activity, participants should be able to discuss ethical dilemmas in clinical practice, and also explain how to use an ethical framework for solving ethical dilemmas. Okay, um, so with that, let's um, start out with the, um, with the first case. Uh, can a mother refuse blood transfusions for her adult daughter? The patient is a 36-year-old female with a substance use disorder on methadone who was admitted with necrotizing infection of the peritonsillar and pharyngeal spaces and submandibular gland. She was found to have a rupture of the right peritonsillar abscess, which uh, required uh, her to have ventilatory support. Um, so the um, uh, orthopedist um, put in a consult. Um, Although not needed at the present time, it is expected that the patient will eventually need blood transfusions. So the ENT surgeon, I'm sorry, I said orthopedist, uh, that's the next case. But anyway, the ENT surgeon approached the mother for consent for blood transfusions. However, the, when the mother was approached for consent, she said she is a Jehovah's witness and she cannot provide consent. And in addition, she said she's refusing uh, that a daughter receive any blood transfusions. The mother said that the patient is not a Jehovah Witness. And at this time, the patient is, was not able to provide consent for herself as she was receiving ventilatory support and being sedated. Okay. So, um, so let me ask the first question. Let me uh, get you all used to answering poll question. And the first uh, question, is the mother the appropriate surrogate decision maker to provide or refuse consent um, for, for the patient? So let me um, bring up this poll. Okay, we got 24. And we have 41 participants. Who's not voting? Four more seconds. Let me end the poll and share the results. So 15% said the mother is the appropriate surrogate decision maker. 26% said no. And about 60% said not, not sure. Um, okay, so a diversity of opinions here, uh, a sizable minority said yes, a little greater than sizable said, said no. Okay, well, with that, let me um, ask the second question. Who can provide consent for the patient for blood transfusions? Uh, obtain court order guardian, another family member, if available, uh, to physician emergency consent. The results are pouring in. Here's the results. 31% uh, said, go get a guardian. 31% said, another family member if available. And what is it? 38% to physician emergency consent. A diversity of opinions here. Well, if another family member is available, then that would be the best 
approach. Um, unfortunately, in this case, another family member was, was not available. A court or a guardian may take some time. The analysis, the mother is, is the legally authorized representative, but she's not acting, it appears to be not acting in the best interest of the patient. She is also not providing a substituted uh, decision, which entails making a decision based on what her daughter would say. Instead, she is basing a decision on, on what she would want for, for herself. Now, while it is understandable why the mother cannot provide consent, she, she is really ethically not able to refuse the administration of blood, blood products. Um, and one, one, could, one could say that she's an unavailable surrogate. Uh, now, uh, Maryland law, well, let's see what the law says. Maryland law shown in this slide says a healthcare provider uh, for an individual uh, incapable of making informed decision who believes that an instruction to withhold or withdraw a life sustaining procedure $8. is um, oh which is inconsist inconsistent with generally accepted standards of patient care shall petition a patient care advisory committee, which is the ethics committee for advice concerning the withholding or withdrawal of the life sustaining procedure from the patient um, and or file a petition in court. So actually going to the ethics committee is, is an option to do and our recommendations for us try to elicit the support of other family members, if available, transfuse blood products when urgently needed with two physician consent. And when the patient regains decision-making capacity, address this issue with the patient. And please inform the mother of the decision of the ethics committee and that she has a, a right to appeal this decision to the ethics committee. Okay, uh, so any final thoughts? She never needed blood transfusions. Uh, and um, before she was extubated and before one could um, address this issue with the patient, she left AMA. That's, that's another story. Okay, good. Now that I've warmed, warmed you all up, uh, let's go into the next case. Case two, are there limits to surgical care for a patient with a suspected, suspected fictitious disorder? Patient is a 39 year old female history of multiple left upper extremity infections, status both above elbow amputation with ongoing revisions last revised in August of 21 and has a wound back in place. She has a opioid drug use disorder. She was uh, last hospitalized this past February for infection treated with IND and antibiotics. Um, <clears throat> in in uh, April, she went to her wound vac clinic and was having wetness, uh, redness of the left amputation site only seen when the wound vac is taken down. She is also having palpitations. When the staff saw the wound, they told her to come to the emergency room. In the ED, she cites she's been having febrile illness Throughout the weekend, T max 101.7, which she could not break um, despite Tylenol at home. She continues on home antibiotics. So, per chart review, there is a concern for factitious disorder since 
2018, given her frequency of infections and suspicion of injecting fecal material in her left upper uh, extremity. Multiple wound cultures have grown flora that is atypical to the skin. Orthopedics is concerned that infections, continued infections, put the residual limb at risk as well as the patient's life at risk. Uh, per notes from a uh, previous um, provider, the patient was um, suspected of placing feces on the wound to induce infection. However, this is speculation as it was not witnessed. Um, now, there is an urban, what I call an urban legend out there. A uh, patient had been seen by an orthopedist at Hopkins, but she was suspected of pur purposefully infecting her arm so she can see him more often and is now barred from Hopkins. Psych, multiple psych evaluations have been inconclusive as no objective e evidence has been found, found for factitious disorder. Uh, <clears throat> a telecitter was instituted to ensure patient safety and reduce the risk of self-harm. Patient is upset with having a telecitter but agree to it if she can have her privacy in the bathroom. The patient refused contralateral casting as recommended by orthopedists. The contralateral casting would prevent her from infecting her contralateral arm. So uh, during this hospital stay, like on the 21st, patient's white count went um, climbed to over 20,000 with pandemia, but she was um, physiologically stable. Evidence that morning, there was evidence that morning of her tampering with the dressing over the anterior aspect of her left stump. Um, and again, the white can had bumped. Um, a few days later, she spiked a fever, heart rate, 118, now the white count up to 33,000. Uh, two days later, a febrile white count went down a little bit. Blood cultures are negative. Next day, febrile white count up to 25, started on antibiotics. Again, all blood cultures negative. Uh, CT showed a stable appearance of a subcutaneous plegmon, which does not appear to be amenable to surgical debridement. At this time, infectious disease and orthopedics are recommending continued medical management. So another poll question, if a factitious disorder is the correct diagnosis, then what is the extent of the patient's autonomous action. Large extent and hence bears responsibility for what occurs, low extent hmm. of autonomous behavior or not sure. Let me bring up this um, poll question and let's see what your thoughts are. Okay, okay. So here's the results. So somewhat evenly divided between she does have autonomous action or her action is autonomous versus low extent and then not sure. Um, so um, what, do you, what do you all think about, uh, is she, um, I mean, this has bears, bear witness to the following questions, but um, anybody want to explain why she doesn't have capability for autonomous action or why she is exhibiting autonomous behavior. All right, so here's another question. If the patient continues to require surgeries, is there a point 
in which orthopedics become complicit with the patient's self-harm as the post-op period increases the ability of the patient to engage in self-harm. If that is making sense, so let me, all right, uh, three more seconds. All right, let me, all right, so it's somewhat um, evenly split. Uh, uh, almost a third said yes, 41% uh, said no, 28% not sure. So um, what, do you, what do you think the surgeons should do? Dr. If, Silverman, I don't know if you're seeing it, but there's some discussion going on in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> unmute yourself. A psych consult is in order. Um, and psych consult. Well, um, previously, uh, the psych consult said uh, there's no objective proof. So uh, if we have any psychiatrists, on the call here, uh, what, um, what services could psychiatry provide? I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm, oh, okay, I'm, but you, you could talk. I'm talking because it's killing me that no one else is talking. I mean, I, uh, I think it's that- It's killing me too. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know how much, uh, this is obviously a very challenging case. I, I don't know. I mean, someone who continues to eat a bacon double cheeseburger despite coronary artery disease, we wouldn't say that, that they shouldn't have an intervention for the my, you know, myocardial infarction because we're enabling their care uh, you know, or enabling their complicit with their self-harm. We're saying we're trying to mitigate the negative results of this self-injurious behavior. And so I, I, don't, I don't, to me, this, this seems like an orthopedist saying, ah, get me the heck out of here. Um, so I, I don't, I think that once, once someone has a, you know, polymicrobial uh, you know, phlegmon that's causing bendemia to 28,000 and a fever of 102, you gotta, you gotta intervene in whatever way you need to, to, you know, address the immediate medical harms that are, that are kind of at play. Um, because I don't, to, to not do that is essentially saying, okay, well, this person's, we're just, we're just signing, we could better sign this person up for palliative care for this, for this behavior. I, I mean, the, I think this, I, I don't understand, Stand. I missed the part of the presentation where we got any insight into why this person would be. If we have any sense of what the why is, uh, no, no sense. She denies any no. self harm. But but other than denying the self harm, do we have a sense of history of trauma or other uh, other psychopathology? Um, any history of uh, childhood um, interactions, positive or negative, with the health system? Uh, abandonment issues. I mean, the, the, I'm, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'm an armchair psychiatrist. And uh, one, you know, the kind of the things that make me wonder, that makes me wonder about. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so um, good questions. Um, and um, um, she has this opioid use disorder. I don't know um, how much that is playing in. Is she, on she, uh, is she on medications for opioid use disorder? Um, I think the um, methadone. Um, and um, she had this trauma to her arm. She was in Sweden and had an infection and got operated on and they left a gauze in her arm and it got infected more and she needed the amputation. I... I agree with you that um, there must be some underlying, if I could call it psychopathology that is um, playing a role in her needing, for the lack of a better phrase, attention. And now I, I, uh, it's interesting to say what you said about um, any other, <laughs> medical illness, I, um, I brought that up with the orthopedist. I said, well, I mean, what do you do with the person in DKA all the time? And he or she 
keeps on eating Twinkies uh, and goes into the uh, DKA. We still obviously have an obligation to treat. Now, having said that, there are some differences between the two scenarios. One, um, uh, I'm not complicit in the patient eating Twinkies where in this case, you're doing an operation which exposes the arm to um, an increased possibility of her doing the uh, self-harm again. And then the, the other thing, the orthopedist said, um, uh, well, how, how much more amputations do I do? Uh, uh, how, I mean, what's, what's the limit here? So um, some differences between the two cases. So, which um, brings, um, so, I mean, what do you do? I mean, you do want to keep on treating, but there's a somewhat, if I could call a hesitancy about doing something that um, uh, is, um, for the lack of a better phrase, it's not going to help and may um, cause even more harm to the point of even death uh, if she gets a real severe infection. So what to do now? So uh, as per orthopedics, um, again, optimal, that, optimal. Um, I'm okay for right now. Okay, I'm glad you're okay right now. What's I'm have that? to meet you. Okay. Who's, okay. Um, uh, not right now, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, Adam, no. could you mute yourself? Okay, thank you. Optimal surgical treatment of this patient is unclear. If the diagnosis is incurable soft tissue infection, then the surgical plan is definitive revision, amputation at a more proximal level, but proximal amputation directly exposes the patient to worsening self-harm. This would be, uh, this should be combined with contralateral casting if she would have the operation. If the self-inflicted infections are contributing to these recurrent multifocal enteric polymicrobial non-contiguous infections, then incision and packing is the surgical treatment that causes the least harm to the patient. A second opinion after careful evaluation independently arrived at the same conclusion that an open surgical intervention would likely to cause more harm than good. So, all right. So the million dollar question is what to do now? Continue with the antibiotics and do one of the following. If surgical intervention is needed, then the patient needs to agree with contralateral casting to ensure the success of the surgery, extend the telesitter to the bathroom, trial of oral antibiotics, and when she stabilizes, send her home or not sure. So, what about her family? Uh, is her family involved or any family members or um, other people? Um, well, she has a husband who has visited her once. What could I say? On the surface, it appears he's not involved. Okay. All right. We're getting some good votes. Five more seconds. I'll end the poll. Let me get one more. All right. Good. So here's the results. Almost three quarters said surgical intervention, but she needs to agree to the contralateral casting. Uh, and then uh, about 10% for the other choices. So, um, so are, are we, um, what do you think? 
uh, are we allowed to, um, or is it, is it acceptable to have a package deal of surgery plus contralateral casting? And if she refuses, don't do the operation? I think the problem is that all of these options don't take into account trauma or psychopathology. I think that there needs to be some combination of medical and psychiatric management who can develop a behavior plan. And then if she's not following the behavior plan, then you have more justification to you know, limit her medical options. But I think that all of these are just purely medical and aren't really addressing what's going on in the background. Well, I, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, uh, there needs to be more um, digging under the surface about her underground or under, underneath, might be underground too, um, behavioral problems. But um, you do that, I agree, in conjunction. Uh, but at the end of the day, if she, I have a sense that's going to take a while if she keeps on denying. Um, uh, um, and I'm just bringing up the prospect that she may need a surgical procedure before we understand her psycho, psychological issues. I mean, thanks for bringing that up. I agree with you 100%, and that appears to be missing from her treatment and care. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, if, she if and when she needs the surgery, should contralateral casting be part of the package? Uh, three quarters of you said yes. And, and this is how it relates back to the previous question I had about her autonomous behavior. Uh, is she acting autonomously? And um, with that in mind, I, uh, uh, right, to be continued. Um, I told the surgeon uh, that um, if that is the ultimate, if that might be the ultimate plan, that she should be told what, what's going to be on the table. So maybe she would understand that this is, if she, if, if she has factitious disorder, uh, then this would be the ultimate treatment. Uh, I mean, surgery with the contralateral casting. Um, so, as I said, to be continued, uh, she currently remains in the hospital, and uh, she was um, uh, uh, a febrile the last day or two, um, and uh, white can coming down. Um, so, um, I think I think the best case scenario is that for her to be um, uh, successfully treated with the antibiotics. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I agree. Let's add some, a holistic approach finally. Henry, I'd like to introduce, you know, the Chinese have a saying, Tai Tan, which means face to face. And it sounds like a lot of what you've said throughout this is that it's really important to have a face to face conversation. Face to face, Tai Tan means that not only do we see each other, but we understand each other. Maybe this case, they could do that with the surgeon, uh, a consulting surgeon and a psychotherapist or someone in the behavioral sciences. Um, well, I, again, I agree with that approach, but um, again, uh, I, I'm, I'm like Aaron, I'm just an ar armchair psychiatrist. And if um, uh, I've spoken to her several times and, she keeps on saying, why don't they believe me? I'm not doing this. Um, I mean, um, it's going to take, uh, and I'm not saying don't do it, but it's going to take a, um, uh, a very de-establishment 
a very, very trusting relationship. Uh, and then we have the issue of confidentiality. Uh, let's say she finally says to the psycho, the therapist, okay, I have been doing it. So Henry, one more thing. This is Chandana Neurology. Yes. I, I think just like how we tell a smoker not to smoke every time we see them in outpatient or inpatient setting, obviously the idea has to be reinforced. Our suspicion, that's part of clinical acumen. Factitious, in factitious disorder, no patient will ever say, well, I was doing something. That's, I guess, in some ways, part of the definition of the disorder. Right, yes. <laughs> I do it no want longer to... becomes factitious if she admits it. Right. Uh, and I want to uh, have an argument against one of the speakers before with the uh, heart uh, cardiovascular disease and eating analogy. Eating is not even a human right. It's the uh, part of life. Like, you know, all living organisms eat. But self-harm, like injecting fecal material, I mean, there is a little bit of a difference. And here we are talking about an amputation um, in a cardiovascular risk case, we do not do open uh, heart surgeries or in transplant patient, alcoholic doesn't get the liver transplant till they are sober. So in my mind, amputation is far more invasive. It is a loss of a limb for an individual and orthopedic surgeons have a right to question if they're ethically doing the right thing by the patient, there is a harm associated with their surgery. That's all. Um, yes, right. Um, uh, uh, thank you for your thoughts. Um, other th thoughts on this challenging case? Very challenging. All right, well, um, again, to be continued um, and, and Again, thank you for all your thoughts. Okay, so let's um, go on to an easier case, how to manage a patient who is refusing treatments. So we have a 25-year-old African-American male who is paraplegic, secondary to a gunshot wound in 16 with the sequela of a neurogenic bladder with chronic indwelling foley, left below the knee amputation, secondary to osteomyelitis and chronic sacral decubitus also. He has a past psychiatric history of a major depressive disorder, conduct disorder, and frequent hospitalizations of refusal of medical treatment. Per chart review, the patient has had progressive worsening of his chronic wounds over the past three months, resulting in his admission to um, UMMC ED for fever, chills, and weight loss with reported increasing drainage from his left leg wound. Uh, so soft tissue service is recommending a tentative plan for surgical debridement. However, once again, he's refusing all dressing changes and has refused to allow the soft tissue team to examine him. He's re uh, refusing uh, oral medications and, and other treatment modalities. Psychiatry is unable to determine his capacity as he refuses to talk with them. <clears throat> Palliative care saw him, wrote a note. He is permanently debilitated due to paraplegia. He has extensive wounds, some of which are untreatable. As an outpatient, he has had no follow-up with healthcare professionals for wound care or medical management. He has refused treatment at times. His functional status is poor. Um, I would not, uh, and the Consultant continues, I would not be surprised if he died in the next six months. I am concerned that without the proper follow-up and wound care that any additional surgical intervention will be ineffective. Given the extent of his wounds, 
regardless of our best efforts, he will die from infection and sepsis at some point. My recommendation is for hospice care where he can have proper wound care and, and best symptom management for pain. So uh, ethical analysis. I actually saw this patient back in 2018 for similar issues. Um, and essentially uh, we have here, we have a patient with significant psychological and physical sequela from a gunshot wound. He is now disengaged from the medical caregivers and is refusing necessary medical interventions. The concern is that at some point, his refusal will cause unnecessary medical harm to himself. So I guess another uh, instance of self-harm. Um, well, one could say, <clears throat> unless you exercise every day, we're all self-harming ourselves, but that's another issue. Anyway, we, we might have reached a tipping point as it appears that the patient is refusing the breathing of wounds that cause his sepsis. Now, I spoke with the patient's mother who wants her son treated for his infected decubitus. She says that he gains much pleasure being around his sibling. So what to do now? Well, uh, we have another poll question. That's what we'll do now. Um, so what should be done now? Hospice, re-engage psychiatry, family meeting. Okay, I think we have a, a consensus here. Can uh, you discuss his religious background? It, it, could we involve someone, uh, a fa person of faith in his uh, decision-making? Well, that's always a good idea. Um, I don't know his religious background. Okay, well, this is um, not unbelievable. 100% say family meeting, why not? Okay, and uh, get at the, um, see what we could get at the issues here. Let's, uh, so, recommendations, meeting with the patient and family and the medical team, both uh, virtual and face-to-face. -face as we commonly do nowadays. Um, so we had this family meeting, but the mother and other family me, uh, members, <clears throat> social work, palliative care, and myself, we discussed with the patient his constant refusals with care and treatment, and that it would be difficult for him to recover from sepsis without treatment. Uh, uh, palliative care brought up uh, the option of hospice. I, I asked him, uh, well, who tends to his wounds at home? And he said his mother. So I asked him, well, help me out here. Uh, why do you accept wound care from your mom, but not in the hospital? And he said, well, uh, he essentially, he likes the way his mother performs wound care uh, rather than the hospital staff and he prefers his mother. I inquired about his goals of care and he said he desires to be home in his wheel, wheelchair and that he enjoys cooking and other activities with his family. And so the attending outline uh, in no uncertain terms that the treatments that will be necessary for him to get better and, com and his complete cooperation will be necessary. He indicated that he will be more adherent with recommended treatment. So uh, not unsurprisingly, the, um, the next day the patient was amenable for, for the soft tissue team to examine him and he agreed to have radiologic procedures. Um, I, I seem to recall he needed uh, nephrostomy tubes for his constant um, urinary tract infection. However, the following day, he was found comatose 
on the bathroom floor for an overdose of opiates. His room was searched and his stash was he removed. He was upset and started to refuse treatment. Uh, I got a call and I said, well, uh, let him settle down. He's acting out because you took away his stuff. And, um, and actually after a few days, he um, adhered to treatments. And, um, um, and this is a social work no, uh, note. Uh, discuss an ID rounds this morning that the patient is ready for transfer home today. He's on room air, taking a PO die, has, has follow-up appointments as scheduled, and um, all about home care is to see, see him for his wound care. And, uh, and uh, he got dressing supplies to, to go home and the ambulance transport is arranged for 12 noon today. Okay, so, um, uh, well, uh, I guess somewhat um, uh, recommended with the previous patient, uh, once we dug down underneath the surface and saw, um, uh, what are, are the issues um, he was able to get with may maybe a little struggle, some uh, the necessary care. Since we have some time, I'd like to discuss this case. Does the patient have the capacity to refuse an LVAD? Patient is a 61-year-old female with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. He present she presented uh, with worsening dyspnea and fatigue, was transferred here, cannulated and initiated on VA ECMO. She was evaluated for advanced heart therapies. The patient stage, uh, she has been told she is likely not going to be considered a good candidate for transplant due to history of previous non-compliance. But while pending a decision from the committee regarding an LVAD, she said she does not want to be tethered to the machine. Psychiatry um, um, saw her, determined that she has cognitive impairment. Uh, her wishes to refuse the LVAD are at odds with her family preference, leading her to be inconsistent and her voice preferences. Today, she stated that her acceptance of the LVAD is solely based on her family's persuasion, um, but her ambivalence regarding pursuing the LVAD is plainly seen in recent documentation. Um, and uh, make a long story longer, um, psychiatry said she may lack the capacity to refuse and a surrogate decision-making uh, maker should be used. Principal diagnosis, acute delirium, hypoactive type. Um, so advanced heart failure team said, um, well, she remains on VA ECMO. Uh, this week, the patient clearly told me she did not want to get an LVAD and that she wanted to die. Uh, today, she said her family talked her into considering an LVAD, but she really doesn't want it. Uh, Transplant Listing Committee said uh, she was presented and turned down uh, by the committee for an LVAD due to non-adherence to follow up and inadequate social support. Uh, and most importantly, she said she doesn't want it. Um, so. What should be done now, okay? Respect the patient's wishes not to have an LVAD, question the decision of the listening committee or have a family meeting. Uh, so let's see what you say about this one here. Respect the patient's wishes, question the decision of the listening committee, have a family meeting. Okay, all right. Well, a uh, family meeting worked the last time, Let's uh, get a few more votes. Sounds a little bit like the family meeting this time is kind of the reverse. 
of the other one. In the what do you mean? Of, in the sense of the last family meeting seemed to be about getting the patient to understand the support, the help, the whatever was there, and that they had they needed to understand the role that the family could help play in their recovery. Sounds here like the uh, dynamic is trying to help the family understand the role that they're playing in the problems the patient's experiencing not feeling respected, not feeling like the family's listening to them, that they're feeling co cajoled, coerced, or forced in some way. So we need to have a conversation with everybody to understand where the different sides and the different parties are coming from. It sounds like maybe the family might not be fully listening to the patient. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, okay, let's end the poll. 39% respect the patient's um, wishes. 58% uh, family meeting, and 3% said uh, uh, questioned the decision of the listing committee. So I, I spoke with the patient's husband who expressed, not surprisingly, his strong desires for his wife to be allowed to pursue a heart transplant or an LVAD. He is upset at the denial of the transplant committee uh, for not listing his wife uh, for a transplant or an LVAD. He strongly disagrees that his wife has been non-compliant with previous appointments or, or that there has been a lack of social support. So we had a family meeting um, with the patient, her daughter, her partner, which was the husband and the medical team. The team briefly reviewed the expectations for post LVAD care and follow-up and voiced concerns that the patient has been inconsistent in her messages to the team, whether she wanted the LVAD or not. Family had been expecting uh, to meet directly with the committee to understand why the patient was turned down. From their perspective, the patient has never been adherent uh, with her medical care. Her husband and daughter report that they help ensure she takes her medications every day and the patient was keeping appointments with her normal physician who had extended the duration between visits once they heard that miss um, that the patient had been taking Ubers for greater than $60 to get to Baltimore. Um, the daughter expressed concern that her mother simply didn't understand the benefits and risks of the treatment options she had been offered and that her mother recently expressed wishes to stop her ECMO, refuse LVAD, was spoken in the heat of the moment while she was afraid and she simply needed time to process and declare the medications she had received that might have been affecting her sensorium. Um, her daughter states that she will be able to provide care to the patient after discharge, including 24-7 care for initial two weeks post-op. She said her brother, a cousin, and her stepfather would be able to be backups for the rides to the appointments. Um, so it was decided for her to be represented with this uh, to the committee uh, that afternoon. And so she was, with this additional information from the family, she was approved for an LVAD, LVAD which was scheduled for the 1st of April, uh, post-op day one, not exclamation point, but post-op day one. The patient was in good spirits today, states she's glad she got the LVAD and glad the surgery is behind her. Um, uh, notes written by the social worker, just details the extra support from the team and the family member to make sure uh, uh, she has follow-up and will adhere with the post-LVAD uh, regimen uh, and uh, psychosocial readiness for discharge. Patient appeared to be in good spirits and looking forward to progressing 
to the next step. So the major, actually, the major point I want to make from this case is is the use the um, uh, the use of psychosocial support parameters to assess compliance suffers from several challenges. One, actually, there's limited evidence that such criteria actually predict post-transplant adherence. Um, and also, there is large practice variations in, in making such decisions and, and its use among transplant uh, centers. And in fact, the European Union and Canada doesn't even use psycho uh, social uh, criteria uh, to determine post-transplant um, um, behaviors. And, uh, and also there's a concern with distributive justice as the use of psychosocial criteria might disproportionately impact patients for the lower socioeconomic uh, groups leading to inequities in the sense that people from the lower socioeconomic uh, classes um, may not be able to take time off from work um, to uh, offer 24 seven care, might not have the expense, expenses to hire nurses to help or might not have other family support in order to do this. So there is an inequity issue with using psychosocial support. And there's a concern with procedural justice if there's a lack of transparency that prevents the opportunity for the patient and family members to institute remedial actions. In fact, a survey of transplant providers uh, uh, said that uh, about 20% of the time the family and the patient are not notified that they're not being listed because of a lack of social support. Um, and as you can see in this case, uh, when the family knew about that, they stepped up to the plate and the patient was listed for an LVAD and she got it and, and she's apparently happy about it. Okay, well, thanks for staying over time and thank you very much. I, I appreciate your voting and, and your points of view. Okay. All thank right. you for a great discussion. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, you all have a good weekend.